Good morning, Crossbrand Cowboy Church. My name is Jason Bryant, and I'm the Western Heritage Consultant for Texas Baptist. Mike asked me if I would share a word with you today, and that's what I'm going to try to do here in a minute. But before I share a word with you, I just want to share a little bit about who I am. Uh, unlike Mike, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't find Christ until I was about 26 years old. And uh, after I found Christ, about six months later, uh, I ended up ex uh, accepting a call to the ministry. I didn't understand what that meant then, and I still don't understand what that means today. But what it has led me to do is it has led me down the road to help start two cowboy churches. Yes, if there was a brain up here in this noggin, I'd probably take it out and play with it because I didn't start just one. I started two. And so my family and I moved to Salado in 2006 and helped start 3C Cowboy Fellowship. And then in 2011, we moved back to Palestine and helped start Triple S Cowboy Church. And in the process of starting that, Texas Baptist opened up this position. And so I threw my resume in the hat and lo and behold, they thought I was a good fit for the job. So now I'm a consultant uh, trying to work with, encourage, and help cowboy churches, existing cowboy churches, and new cowboy church starts. So anyway, that's enough about me. Cody and the band are going to lead some worship songs, so I hope you'll stick around for them, and hopefully you'll stick around after that and give me a listen. Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Cross Brand Church this morning. We're so glad that you tuned in with us. Um, we're glad you're with us. We realize that there are many, many online services these days so you could choose from a bunch of different ones and you chose us so thank you very much for that so we're gonna worship a little bit
standing at your door my heart is calling yours come fall into my arms you're weary from it all been running for too long i'm here to bring you home i'm reaching out i'll chase you down i dare you to believe how much i love you now don't be afraid i am your strength we'll be walking on
All right, well, I'm glad you're back here with me and you stuck around this long, Crossbrand. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about serving. And I'm going to kind of piggyback on what uh, Mike has talked about the last four weeks. He didn't give me this topic. Um, and actually, I was here for three. Uh, I didn't share that with you when we started. Uh, Crossbrand Cowboy Church is our family's home church. It's where my wife and, and twins, when they're not off at school, and myself, where we attend church. And I've, 
gotten to attend church a whole lot more during COVID, but usually I'm out traveling around the state visiting other cowboy churches. And so I was off uh, preaching during one of the chaos messages. But Mike has talked about the last four weeks in this chaos series about weaponizing prayer, having a conversation about the hard stuff. All human life has value. And the source of the chaos last, last week he talked about was sin. And so I want to kind of piggyback on the chaos uh, sermon series and talk about serving today and serving in the chaos. And it was interesting, a couple of weeks ago on NBC, New, NBC Nightly News, I saw a news feed about a young man from Buffalo, New York, who went out and served after the protesting had turned to rioting and looting in, in Buffalo, New York. In fact, uh, the young man's name is Antonio Gwynn Jr., if you didn't see that. And uh, anyway, he went out and attended the protesting that evening, and he got tired, so he went home to get some rest. And lo and behold, when he got back up about 2 o'clock in the morning, he realized that the peaceful protesting that he was a part of turned into rioting and looting. And so uh, he just thought, what could he do? And so, lo and behold, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he gathered up a broom and some cleaning supplies, some trash bags, and he went back to downtown uh, Buffalo, and he started cleaning up. He hoped that he would be done uh, by when people started going to work. Well, 8 o'clock rolled around, and he wasn't done. In fact, 11 o'clock the next day rolled around, and he still wasn't done. Uh, but what he did was he cleaned about 17 blocks, sweeping up glass and other debris and protest signs that people had left. And uh, anyway, so I just thought that was a pretty amazing story that this young man who was a high school senior, he, he was just graduating high school, took it upon himself to go out and serve his community in light of what had happened. And I think that's a pretty amazing story of serving through the chaos. And that's what I want to talk to you today about is, is serving through the chaos. Uh, now, I want to say this up front, and I, I'm going to kind of steal this from Mike. I know he says this a lot when uh, he's sharing messages. I hope that you won't turn me off because I'm going to say this, but I just want to get this out there today. I, I'm not going to try to be political and have any type of political agenda or anything like that, but I want to let you know today, I don't believe that a political party has an answer for the chaos that's going on here in America today. I don't believe that a politician has a uh, a remedy for the chaos that's going on here in America today. But you know what I do believe? I do believe that Jesus Christ is an answer for the chaos, and I do believe His church, Big C, when we're talking about all the church, has an answer for the chaos that's going on here in America today. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit more about today, is serving through the chaos. And there's no better example that we can look to than the example of Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote about that in Philippians chapter 2, and so I want to read some of Philippians chapter 2 to you this morning. Paul says this, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if, the, if there is any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. We need to be focused on one goal, church. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Everyone, now this is an important verse. I started it, but I'm going to go back and everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Did you hear that this morning? I'm going to read it again. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. We as Christ followers aren't supposed to just look out for ourselves. Of course, it doesn't take very much of turning on the TV or being on social media, being on Facebook or any of that other stuff. That's what the world really teaches us, right? That we ought to take care of ourselves, that we ought to take care of our own interests. But that's not what Jesus Christ did. And Paul teaches the church at Philippi, that's not what they should do. We shouldn't just look out for ourselves. We should look out for others as well. And so that's just kind of the introduction into really the heart of what I want to get into this morning. In verse 5, Paul says this, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. So we've got to work at an attitude. Part of the chaos problem is an attitude problem. 
And so we need to work on our attitude. We can't worry about the other person's attitude. We've got to work on our attitude. And so how are we going to do that? It says this, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, is, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave and taking the likeness of men. And when he had come as man in his eternal form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So I think there are three things that we can learn from these uh, short verses uh, that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And the first one is, when you look at Philippians 2, verse 5 and 6, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. We have to think like a servant. We really have to work at thinking like a servant. You know, that's the amazing thing. Jesus Christ was and is God. Jesus Christ was God from the beginning of the world. Jesus Christ was there with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in the creation of everything. He spoke and said, let there be light. He spoke and separated the waters from the dry land. He spoke and created all the living things. He spoke and he created all the trees and the plants and, and all those wonderful things. Jesus Christ was there. He didn't just come along when he was conceived in Mary's womb. He was there the whole time. But he didn't think being God was something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, when you read down later, it said he humbled himself and he was obedient. And so we need to take a lesson after Jesus Christ. We need to think like a servant. And it's hard for us today. It was hard over 2,000 years ago for those first 12 disciples. Because if you don't remember, in Matthew chapter 20, uh, James and John, their mother came to Jesus, and, they, and she said this to Jesus, Jesus, I want to ask you a favor. And Jesus said, well, what's the favor you want to ask? And their mother said, I want one of my sons to sit at your left hand and one of your sons to sit at your right hand. Can you do this one thing for me? And Jesus said, you really don't know what you're asking. Uh, and he said, those places of authority are not mine to grant. And he, in fact, Jesus asked them, do you think you can drink from the cup that I'm going to drink? And they answered, <laughs> I imagine they answered kind of quickly, like we answer quickly to some things when we don't know uh, exactly what somebody's asking. They said, oh, yes, Jesus, we can drink the cup. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup. But he said, it's not mine to say who's going to sit at my right or my left hand. And then, you know what happened when the ten other disciples heard about this? Let me read it. It says, when the ten disciples heard, they became indignant at the two brothers. You know what indignant means? It means they were mad. It means they were ticked off. It means uh, they were really unhappy with what James and John had done, or at least what their mother had done. But Jesus didn't use this opportunity and just kind of set it aside. He used it as a teaching moment. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what did Jesus teach his disciples? Don't be thinking greater than you ought to be thinking. Think of yourself in a humble regard and think of yourself like a servant because I, Jesus Christ, came to be your servant. And so you in the same way ought to think to be like a servant just like I'm being a servant. Of course, they didn't understand it completely then because Jesus Christ hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't done, he hadn't fulfilled his ministry yet. But they would look back upon this after Jesus went to the cross and God through the Holy Spirit would bring greater insight to this. So we've got to challenge ourselves in these times of chaos. We've got, if we're going to serve through the chaos, we've got to think like a servant. So not only did Jesus think like a servant, he didn't uh, consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In Philippians 2, 7, it said, Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking the likeness of men. So he was willing to leave the comforts of heaven. 
He was willing to leave being a God who spoke things into existence. I'm kind of simple-minded. I kind of like to think of it this way. You know, it says that when God got to creating Adam, that he formed the dust of the earth and he breathed the breath of life into it. I can just imagine that if God did the forming of the dust with his hands, that it was Jesus Christ who bent over and breathed the breath of life into Adam. I, I don't know. It doesn't say that in the Bible. I, I know. But Jesus is just so active in the rest uh, throughout the Bible and in other places that in my mind, I just kind of see that. And so imagine the God who spoke, who spoke everything into existence, who breathed the breath of life into Adam, deciding he would come down and be a man and have to put up with being hungry, with ha having to put up with being tired, having to put up with all the human things that we have to put up with. Jesus Christ never knew those things when he was in heaven, when he was God, but yet he willingly chose to position himself to be a servant. And so there's a lesson in that for us. Uh, we need to position ourselves as servants in the world today. And, you know, it's not easy to position ourselves to serve in church. It, it, it's much more than just coming to church and what we do for 45 minutes or one hour one day a week. Uh, we really need to look at ways just like um, the young man in Buffalo, New York, Antonio Gwynn Jr. He positioned himself. He didn't just stay in his bed that night. He went out at 2 o'clock in the morning and started sweeping and cleaning up a mess that he didn't make. That's amazing to me. And so we, as followers of Jesus Christ, need to do the same. Some of you might not be old enough to remember this, but I remember growing up, there used to be a thing called full-service gas stations. Uh, in fact, I think all gas stations probably started off full-service, but through the years, you had to pay somebody to be there to pump the gas or to check the air pressure in the tires or to check the oil or to check the transmission fluid. And so it became cheaper for gas stations not to pay somebody and to put out a self-service sign. And so most of us today, but I remember my grandmother growing up into the late 80s, she had never pumped her own gas. There were a few places where I grew up down in Pasadena, Texas, that still had full service gas stations. And so she went out of her way to go to the full service gas stations. But you know, that's a thing of the past. I don't know if there's a place in Texas anymore or around the country that's a full service gas station. There might be a few, but it's more about self-service. You get out and do it yourself. And I know it's not quite the same thing, but I think sometimes as churches, we've become self-service. We really don't think about those people outside our walls very much. And sure, we're supposed to minister to one another. We're supposed to help one another. Uh, we're supposed to consider others that are part of the body of Christ. But you know what? How do those people outside these walls, how do they ever come to know Jesus Christ if you and I aren't willing to position ourselves to serve? It's an interesting thought. We as the church, uh, the church of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, people who call on the name of Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and be our Lord and our Savior, we need to position ourselves in the world today. If we want to see an end to some of this chaos, then we're going to have to position ourselves to serve. So not only think like a servant, not only position ourselves to serve, but then we've got to follow through and serve. You know, Jesus Christ didn't just think about coming and being the perfect sacrifice on the cross. He didn't just come and, and, and was born of Mary and lived here for 30-something years. He actually had to go to the cross. In Philippians 2, it says, And when he had come, this is the end of verse 7, And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Jesus Christ went and did what you and I could never do. He paid that sin debt. Uh, Mike talked about that last week, right? That part of the problem of the chaos is a sin problem. And you and I all have a sin problem. We have it because we inherited it all the way back to Adam and Eve. And then we choose. We choose sin. Uh, even though we don't want to sometimes, we choose sin. But Jesus Christ went to the cross. He paid that sin debt that you and I could never pay. He followed through with it. He said in the garden, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass. He didn't want to go to the cross. 
He didn't want to have to hang up there. But if that's what it took for you and me to have forgiveness of sin, for us to have a pathway to God, he was willing to do that. And you know, it's interesting to me as well. One of the last accounts that we have of Jesus with his 12 disciples, when he took them in together and they observed the Lord's Supper together. Uh, and he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body uh, which is given for you. And he took the cup and they blessed it and he said, this is my blood which is given for you. But then after they had observed the supper, it talks about Jesus took one more opportunity to serve his disciples. And I think it's interesting. So it says in John chapter 13 and verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, so Jesus took off his robe and he tied a towel around his waist and it said he went around to each of the 12 disciples and he washed their feet. Now he didn't wash their hands. They had already washed their hands before they ate. And in fact, it says that when Jesus got to Peter, Peter said, no, Jesus, you won't wash my feet. But Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And what did Peter say? Peter said, well, don't just wash my feet then, Jesus. He said, wash my head, wash my hands, wash everything. And Jesus reminded him, no, Peter, we've already eaten. You've already washed your hands. It's your feet that nobody came and washed. Because usually when they would come in from somewhere, there would be a servant who would come and would wash their feet. Well, nobody was there to wash the feet, but yet Jesus took this once again as an opportunity to teach about his purpose and what he came to do, which was to be a servant. And again, that's where you and I, as little Christ, Christians, as followers of Christ, we're supposed to do the th same thing. We're supposed to serve. And so Jesus washed their feet, and he said this to them, You ought also to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. So Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and he said, This same example, you ought to wash other people's feet. Now, it's not something that we do very much today, but Jesus said we ought to do it. And in verse 16, he says, I assure you, a slave is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I think verse 16 is interesting. A messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. You and me, we're supposed to be messengers for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to go and tell people in our workplaces, in our schools, in our towns, in our communities. We're supposed to tell people the hope, the good news that we have of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be the messengers. And you know what Jesus said? A messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. And he goes on and says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Wow. You and I, church, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. If we want to help bring Jesus in the midst of this chaos, we're going to have to do some serving. And so I asked a good friend of mine today, Brother Charles Thomas. He's the pastor up at Northeast Texas Cowboy Church. I asked him to come today so that I might wash his feet. Come on, Brother Charles. Tell us when you're ready. I got to wash yours now. Okay, okay, okay. Don't trick me now. Are we good? Yeah. Brother Charles? Yes, sir. I appreciate you today. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come and, and uh, let me do this today because I know it's one thing to talk to people about preaching, about serving, and, and all that kind of stuff but it's another thing sometimes to humble ourselves. And so I know all these folks aren't going to be in the building on Sunday morning. And uh, so I thank you for letting me take this opportunity uh, to be humble and show the attitude of Christ through washing your feet today. Amen. Brother. Lord, Pastor, I thank you for what you do for the ministry. Ooh, that's still pretty warm, isn't it? <laughs> I thank you for what you do for the ministry. I thank you for what you do for the kingdom. And uh, I know that God uses you in powerful ways. And I just want to tell you, brother, I thank you for how you let him use you. And uh, I'm just going to say, I know you're going to preach this Sunday. So uh, I just pray that the Lord uses you in a powerful way uh, to preach his word. 
and to, to help the folks there at Northeast Texas Cowboy Church do what God's called you to do, and that's be a light right there in Hawkins, Texas. So I thank you, brother. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you. Yes, sir. He said he wouldn't uh, let me wash his feet if he didn't get the opportunity to wash my feet. So I guess turnabout's fair play. Thank you for letting me do it. Yes, sir. Appreciate you immensely. So I realize that uh, it's not real easy to carry around water and, and a towel with you to go wash somebody's feet, right? And it's not easy like Antonio Gwynn. Most of you aren't going to go uh, pick up uh, after a riot and looting and all that kind of stuff. But you and I, we have to look for the opportunities that God gives us to serve in the world today. Maybe for some of you, it's uh, helping somebody fix their car. Maybe for some of you, it's going and mowing somebody's grass that needs to be mowed. Maybe for some folks, it's uh, watching somebody's kids while they go grocery shopping or go run some errands that they need to run in our day and time. Uh, maybe for somebody it's taking sick people some food or something like that. Whatever it is, we need to look for opportunities uh, to serve the world around us. Um, I just want to close with this thought. I did a little more after I saw uh, after I saw the news run on Antonio Gwynn Jr. I, I read an article. I googled it and found that the Washington Post had written an article about him and. Um, it said that two years ago his mother passed away and when his mother passed away uh, the pastor of a church uh, there in Buffalo New York had taken him in and I was really intrigued I, I was really hoping to hear so I got on Facebook and I searched Antonio Gwynn Jr. and sure enough Antonio Gwynn Jr. was on Facebook so I messaged him on Facebook and I introduced myself I said Antonio my name is Jason Bryant I'm a preacher down in Texas and I saw your story on the news and I read your ar the article about you in the New York Post, uh, in the Washington Post. And I just wanted to ask you, I know that you attend church. Did you do what you did because of Jesus Christ? Did you go out and start cleaning up because of the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ? I said, because I know sometimes the news uh, really doesn't pick up or want to let those things out. <laughs> I kind of waited anxiously, and he wrote me back, and essentially he said he did what he did because he thought it was the thing to do. Um, and really, I was disappointed. I was hoping that the young man would say, I did what I did because Jesus Christ has done so much for me, or something along those lines. And so I just want to encourage you. People in our world can serve, just like Antonio Gwynn served. Uh, but for us, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to follow through and be sure and tell people that the reason that we're doing it is because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So I hope if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, um, you'll take the opportunity to, to try to get to know him or, or investigate more about what it takes to, to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. But for those of us who do have a relationship with him, it's time for us to get out and serve in the midst of the chaos.